Thank you much, Maria. We always have so much to uh, Next, uh, this will be our third and final talk in diabetic TRDs. I'm, it's a pleasure to introduce Dr. David Chu. Dr. David Chu is um, working with us at Will's Eye Hospital. He was one of our fellows, and he's a superb surgeon. He's also very committed to education. He has a website called iGuru, which I guess is is appropriate for the Indian Ophthalmology Society. Um, so iGuru.org has a bunch of different videos and lecture series on different talks in retina and other ophthalmologic conditions as well. Uh, David, welcome, and we look forward to hearing from you. Well, um, thank you, Sunir. Thanks for the invitation. And uh, thank you to all the other speakers who've come before me and who will come, and thanks to the audience as well. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here at the International Ophthalmic Conclave. So um, first thing I'll say is hang in there, everyone. We're gonna slam you with more videos. So hopefully it's the last one. Try not to get bored. And I wanted to share with you some thoughts about diabetic TRD. Dr. Garg taught me. I graduated from a uh, fellowship. What was it? Oh, I think in 2020. And I'd like to reflect on what he has taught me, what other mentors have taught me, what I've learned over the last couple of years in independent practice about this very challenging unmet need in our field. Let me see if I can advance this slide here. No relevant disclosures. Bausch and Lohm makes vitrectomy instrumentation, but what I'll talk about with small gauge vitrectomy is applicable to all platforms here. It was the advent of uh, vitrectomy in general to treat diabetic vitreous complications. And here, half a century later, in 2023, diabetic TRD is still one of the greatest unmet needs. We've improved a lot in our visualization small gauge instrumentation, anti-VEGF. It's made our surgery more safe and more efficient. But nonetheless, the basic tenets of doing diabetic TRD, as Dr. Barakal said, as Dr. Verma said, is to completely remove the hyaloid, so I'll echo that, and the associated fibrosis along the posterior part of the hyaloid. It's a misnomer to say it's pre-retinal fibrosis, although I will continue to say that, but it's really fibrosis grown along the hyaloid. Separation of that and attacking areas to uh, preferentially remove that fibrosis and that hyaloid from the retina is the goal of diabetic vitreous surgery. And along with that, allowing the retina then to settle down to remove the traction from fractional retinal detachment. And along the way, do as much as possible to avoid iatrogenic retinal breaks because the presence of retinal breaks and residual traction will require potentially a long-term tamponade like long-term gas or oil and increase the risk of complications like recurrent retinal detachment. So on that note, I'd like to present what I think of as a typical, prototypical advanced diabetic case over here. I hope the video plays well, but this is a patient with en encircling fibrosis, and importantly, who has detachment, complete macular detachment, as well as detachment extending deep into the mid periphery, 360 degrees, with very limited opportunity for PRP. And this goes back to that age old concept in surgery of sharp versus blunt dissection. Here in the retina, we talk about delamination and segmentation. It's always been said uh, from many people and from long ago that you should never completely try to tackle these dense membranes with delamination alone to try to peel them with forceps because of the risk for iatrogenic retinal breaks. So, what I'd like to start off with and propose to everyone is to use that forceps not to completely remove those membranes uh, as a whole, but really to pluck at them, to reflect those edges, to tease at them, to move that fibrosis and the retina along with it. That will dynamically allow you to assess where these membranes are attached, find the weak areas, and then use small gauge cutters like 25 or ideally 27 gauge instrumentation to get rid of those fibrosis, that those areas of fibrosis with segmentation. That I think, gives you a lot of efficiency, gives you a lot of intel about these membranes and allows you to do, uh, proceed more efficiently. So don't forget about the forcep, even as you see so much being talked about with, uh, the, uh, with the cutter and the segmentation. So that's the first thing I'll talk about. The second thing, stretch retinal holes are not uncommonly associated with uh, tractional retinal detachment, leading to a combined regnotogenous and tractional detachment. They're often located underneath these membranes. They may not be known about until you get to the operating room. So here's another prototypic case, a patient with confirmed TRD on V-scan, but overlying dense vitreous hemorrhage, precluding good view to the retina unless that's clear. So as we clear the vitreous hemorrhage, as, long as, we, as we continue to clear that fibrosis, 
And then we remove some of the pre-retinal liquid blood over the surface of the retina with a soft tip. We then find ourselves engaging an area of subretinal fluid and chronic the hemoglobinized subretinal hemorrhage in Schlieren. So you can see that hole, it's got rounded edges. You can note that it's chronic. So what do you do with this extra macular hole? Here I propose uh, a use of ILM peeling, which is something I do for these extra macular holes, but also for macular holes and also for other indications in diabetic surgery too. And so I'd like to extend that peel all the way out to the, the area where that hole is. It allows uh, uh, for relaxation of the tangential traction. It gives slack back to the retina. This is the same concept that we use when we treat just regular old full thickness macular holes. It's helpful in this kind of situation as well because it prevents surface proliferation coming out of that hole. Often you will see that as you can see some pre-retinal proliferation, true pre-retinal proliferation like PBR. That is different than the normal proliferation along the posterior hyoid. That is typical of just a tractional diabetic uh, disease. It's also very helpful for island peeling when you remove uh, when you fail to remove or you feel it's unable, it's unsafe to remove residual fibrous membranes to further relax the macula. And that goes back to what Maria had said to help just uh, allow that macula to settle back. Uh, the next thing I'd like to talk about, the peripheral cortical vitreous. So when you think about encircling TRDs, everyone says, well, we got to relieve the traction from this encircling fibrosis along the arcades to the macula. It's also important to think about what happens beyond those arcades. And you got to segment that traction from the arcades to the aura serrata as well. And so those areas are equally important to address. Here's a case highlighting that. This case is not a complex diabetic TRD here. The, the, the hemoglobinized vitreous hemorrhage, the tractional fibrosis over the macula is quite easily segmented. It's very easy and attractive and tempting to say, you know what, I've gotten rid of those membranes, I've freed the macula, I'm gonna go home. But this is not a terribly complex case, not high risk is what uh, Maria was saying. I like to use trimcinolone in almost every diabetic case at the end of dissection of the visible membranes. It helps to highlight the, uh, the, the residual cort uh, cortical gel. You can see in this case, there's a lot of cortical gel that was attached in the periphery. Segmenting that uh, is really important because it reduces the incidence of per, uh, 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 persistent traction, not in the macula, but from the outside edge. That can lead to recurrent vitreous hemorrhage or even the formation of new retinal breaks leading to a recurrent detachment. Related to that is something else that trimcinolone can help uh, identify, and that's vitreoschisis membranes. It goes by many names. It's completely separate from the posterior hyaloid. This is something that's present in the periphery as well as in the macula, and it's uh, overlying the pre-retinal surface. It's very common in diabetics, especially these young diabetics. Getting rid of this can also help avoid contracture as well as hemorrhage. So here's a moderately uh, severe diabetic patient here. You can see that while the retina is attached, there's complete fibrosis encircling and growing over the macula. We uh, use our techniques using the forceps to uh, identify where those weak areas are. We segment that with the cutter, and then we finish off with some trimcinolone. And what you'll see here, even after complete removal of those membranes in the hyaloid, is this thin sheet, nicely highlighted by the uh, trimcinolone. This is the vitreous schesis membrane. Getting rid of this can be very helpful, and it's very common to see this in diabetics. We're using the cutter here to aspirate and remove these membranes, but you can also use a flex loop or another scraping instrument like a Tano scraper. I think it's been highlighted by uh, Dr. Barico, by Dr. Verma, that uh, treatment preoperative with PRP can be very helpful. I definitely agree. One of the advantages of doing PRP over anti-VEGF is that you can do this in advance of surgery by a great deal. You know, most of the times people agree that anti-VEGF preoperatively can be helpful. And most people would do that days or maybe a few weeks beforehand, but you can do PRP months or well in advance of the need for TRD surgery. This may help induce more gentle contracture of the fibrosis, allowing for more root, that separation from the posterior hyaloid and fibrosis and the surface of the retina. And again, it helps quiescence vascularization same way that anti-VEGF works. And importantly, it provides that retinal counter-traction. And going back to the idea of the advanced TRD, one of the things I think that is really challenging for us and can be very challenging to win for uh, surgically is when you have a near pan retinal detachment where the macula is detached, where the periphery is detached, where you have limited opportunity for PRP and you have to find and, and take that dissection out into the mid periphery. That's where you're at the limit of visualization. You're at a point where the retina is thin you're at the a point where the retina is very mobile, 
and where the fibrosis may be broadly attached, those are situations that are very risky and challenging for, for diabetic TRDs. So I'd like to show a case over here where complete PRP was applied preoperatively. You can see that this has really greatly helped the surgery because the vitreous hemorrhage is dehemoglobinized and the membranes have separated from the surface of the retina, this great room. It, and it's really reduced this case to a very simple case where you're uh, you know, just segmenting these light membranes and that'll be the end that's greatly helped uh, this patient. Here's another patient here who's a 40 year old type one diabetic, dense vitreous hemorrhage presenting new for us. And uh, you never know what you're gonna find under these, these membranes, especially in a patient who has recurrent bouts of vitreous hemorrhage, but we're happy to find the patient actually had very dense and aggressive PRP. By some standards, some people would say, you know, that's very dense and aggressive, more than it's necessary. What you also note in this type one diabetic is almost complete absence of any tractional detachment at all. And that's one of the benefits of doing PRP. Type one diabetics, I do think benefit a lot from PRP because they, they have a lifelong battle with this kind of thing. And sooner or later, vitreous hemorrhage may rear its head, even if they're well into their forties or later. I'll give you one more example. This is something sort of uncommon. Here's a type one diabetic in their thirties and uh, there's dense dehemoglobinized vitreous hemorrhage and there's a retinal detachment here as well. And so we take this patient to the operating room. You notice that there's shallow macular detachment. There's mostly complete hyaloid separation, especially in the periphery. So we're lucky and we're very happy about that. There's no PRP, there's no opportunity for PRP. You can see that the detachment is extending into the periphery. One thing that you'll note curiously in this patient is that there's not a lot of TRD over here although there is a lot of detachment. And you know what? Young people in their 30s can get retinal detachments, can't they? You can note here in the inferior nasal periphery, there's, a, there's an atrophic hole. This is pre-existing. This is the source of this patient's attachment. I've seen this a couple of times, you know, three or four times over the last two years. A scant amount of uh, traction, uh, uh, vitreous hemorrhage being present, panretinal or near panretinal detachment with an open retinal break in the periphery. Patients who have atrophic holes are not uncommon. Patients who have atrophic holes and some degree of traction due to diabetes, uh, that greatly potentiates the possibility for leading to a frank retinal detachment as has occurred in this case. That's the cause of a break. It changes the game. This is a patient not with a tractional retinal detachment from diabetes, but a regmatogenous detachment complicated by the fact that they have type one diabetes and some degree of traction. So what do you do over here? Well, you can't just do a trectomy on a 31 year old uh, who has an atrophic hole-related retinal detachment, that would not be the most ideal thing. We've peeled ILM, we've removed some uh, cortical vitreous schesis, and what we're going to do after even we started the vitrectomy is we'll add a scleral buckle. We've got to address the vitreous hemorrhage, but we've got to treat this eye like a uh, retinal detachment associated with lattice degeneration and atrophic holes. We're going to apply PRP, we're going to uh, you know, treat the break, we're going to flatten the retina, and we're going to leave gas for this patient's eye. I'm not saying that every single time you got to add a scleral buckle, but certainly if the patient in the eye calls for it, there's already some intrinsic contraction, not just contracture along the hyaloid as is a typical diabetic, but here in a regmatogenous case, you're gonna have some contracture intrinsically of the retina. That may be something to consider as well. And so that's the end of my talk. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, David. Those were really cool cases. Um, is there like a standard approach that you 